like uh, Vito said, my power was restored last night. I've been living out of a duffel bag for three weeks at my mother's place while um, the, the relief was going on in Rockaway. I don't know if any of you know how hard Rockaway was hit, but at Breezy Point, that same area, houses were leveled, you know, the ocean came and met the Jamaica Bay, Atlantic Ocean and Jamaica Bay touched, the boardwalk, concrete slabs all over the place. And uh, for me personally, um, I have a three-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter, and, you know, seeing them night after night sleeping in snowsuits and uh, uh, coats with hoodies on and hats on, you know, it really touched me on an emotional level because any fathers in the room, mm -hmm. you, you know you don't ever want your children to go through something like that. So, you know, instinct kicked in and um, that's kind of what I want to talk about today is being unstoppable because, you know, um, Hurricane Sandy did so many things for us, but to us, but I believe for those of us that are here and for those of us who are still going on and, and progressing the positive culture, that Hurricane Sandy did not stop us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that my being here is also a testament to what I'm going to say. But first, let me address uh, something in regards to uh, my faith as Vito shared, because um, one question that I had, is money the root of all evil? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about money mindset. and. My story begins much uh, sooner than uh, the, the example that Vito gave about me working at the alumni office. My, my entrepreneurial experience started when I was about seven years old, or actually no, 10 years old in, in uh, third grade. I moved to Brooklyn from a far Rockaway and then we moved back to Rockaway. But um, when I moved to Brooklyn, I always loved to draw. And I went to my mother's job. She used to work for a Jewish bank called Bank Leumi down in downtown Manhattan. And uh, when, when she took me to work with her, you know, as the cute little kid at, at work, I was able to run amok and play with the copy machines and all of these things. And people let me go because of the charming smile that I put on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, drew, I used to draw, draw uh, drawings when I was there because, you know, there was little much you could do except for, you know, roll the, the filing. They had the big file, uh, the, the big files, and you just roll them and watch them collapse and, you know, collide <laughs> with one another and got me in some trouble, but, you know, so it is. So um, I, I would draw a drawing and um, her co-workers would say, wow, that's really good. So then what I thought was if her co-workers like them and they're adults, then maybe people around my neighborhood would like them as well. So what I did was one day I drew up uh, about 10 different comic book designs or drawings and went to my mother's job, and this is, this is what you call OPM right here. <laughs> Used the job copying machine to make hundreds of copies. And in my neighborhood, I enlisted an army of friends and siblings to help me sell my drawings for a quarter and for 50 cents. And uh, what I found out at the end of the day was that I, you know, I wasn't a millionaire, but it was a fulfilling experience because that sandwich I was able to buy it was the best sandwich I ever ate. You know, it was about five five dollars and twenty-five cents is what I made. But when you break that down into quarters, you know, it's a pretty good uh, a day. So I went from a being like that, you know, driven and not letting anything stop me, to uh, 2010 in my own business, uh, having questions about, wow, do I charge people for this, or you know, am I am I supposed to ask for money now? Is it, is it wrong of me to ask for money? And it came to the point where there was a, a old church mother, because I, I do faith-based work, I own my own graphic design firm, which is their artistry group, and, and we work with corporations, businesses, we actually have a city contract working with HRA to develop a couple of back-to-work manuals. Um, and so we work with all of these different entities, but a, a, a portion of my business is with the faith-based community. So I was working with a, um, an old church mother and you know, sweet, oh God bless you darling. And you know, you, you don't want to take money from them because you know, they're sweet, you know, they're the type that give you cookies after service, what have you. So there, there was a, a, a struggle in my mind of, of how, how do I do this? How do I conduct business when dealing with people that tug on your heartstrings in such a way? And uh, it, it came to the point where I did the work and she asked me, well, how much do you charge? 
And you can imagine as an entrepreneur having that question <laughs> asked to you, a check without a number on it, are you kidding me? But then that, that part in your heart says, I can't do this. Uh, She's probably down to her last hundred dollars and has a whole community of children to feed. You can't do this. But then I said, man, you know, I don't, I don't know when this and that. And here's what she said to me. Mm -hmm. She said, son, I know how to do ministry and I know how to do business. And this is business. Wow. So you give me your practice. <laughs> yeah. And from that moment, from that moment on, something went off in my mind where I had to separate my internal feelings. I realized it wasn't a, a faith-based argument or it wasn't a faith-based issue. It, it stemmed from what Christina talked about. It, it was a fear, internal fear of rejection that I had. I was seeking for approval and, and it, it, it kind of brought me through some weird channels because in order to get the approval, you have to suck it all in, and in order to suck it all in, you know, you have to appear as this nice person that doesn't want to offend. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't a theological discussion. It was a thought-like discussion. It was, you know, a belief system discussion. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to talk about what I want to talk about now, which is being unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Because anytime you mean to do something in life, obstacles are going to come in your way. How many of you can attest to that? Can we say that, amen? <laughs> <laughs> Everything was, was cool when, when you were down at the bay and your feet were in the water. Everything was good. Everyone was all right with you. But the moment you, you grabbed hold of the vision and what it took to break your family out of financial poverty, to, to move from just desire to visions and dreams, all of a sudden, you stepped out of the station, and here was the hailstorm. Anyone ever had that? And we wonder, where did this come from? Well, anytime you, you take a step out to go after your dreams, there's going to be opposition. And that's why it's important for us to be unstoppable. Because like the great Zig Ziglar said, he said, the elevator to success is always out of service, but the stairs are working just fine. Yeah. If you want an easy life, you don't have to do anything for it. But if you want to make something of yourself, and if you want to go against the grain, you're going to have to be prepared to go against the grain. But the reason why you have to be unstoppable is because there's a dream inside of you that the world needs to, to benefit from. We all have an obligation to make this world better than we found it. That's all of our obligation. And how money ties into this, I'm going to get to it in a minute. You have to be unstoppable because adversity and obstacle are attracted to people who want to stand out from the crowd. So you're here this morning and this afternoon because you chose to stand out from the crowd. And, and guess what? There's opposition waiting for you when you get home. Believe I, yeah, I, I can yep. tell. We, 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 we. <laughs> The first thing we, we want to um, think about is recognizing, like I recognized while talking with Craig, and I'm thankful for that, that uh, um, the workshop um, illustration of the, the, the session that we went through. Because I found out that Craig and I, we have the same beliefs about money. Because he said, what does money mean to you? The first word that came to me, <coughs> tool, tool. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is money a God or is money a tool? Now, a tool is something that we use, an apparatus we use to do work, mm -hmm. right? But a, a God is one to be revered and one to be worshipped and one to be sacrificed for. And, you know, some people do all types of things in the name of worship. So is money a God or is it a tool? And we can say things verbally, but the real answer will be in our interaction or our love life with money. So the first thing you have to um, recognize in being unstoppable is get the idea of what money means to you. Is it something that you're going to chase after? Or is it something that you're going to use to help you do something great in this world? And that's what Craig and I agreed on. And here's, here's what the scriptures say about 
uh, money. I, I thought that money was the root of all evil. But what I found when I did my research was that the love of money yeah. is the root of all exactly. evil. The passion against all else is the root of all evil. Here's what the scriptures say. It says in 1 Timothy 6 and 10 in the New Testament, for the love of money is the root of evil, for through it they have erred from the faith. That means they left their internal convictions in pursuit of something that I deem a tool and a byproduct. Everyone understand? And because of this, they have pierced themselves with many sorrows. And what that simply means is if you chase after a tool, what, what, what the Lord, what the universe intended for you to use as a tool, there's not going to be any substance there. So I had to come to that realization that money isn't to be worshipped or chased after. It's something that you should use as a tool. And that sent the light off in my head and made me realize that I'm put on this earth for something more and money is just a compartment to my greater vision and purpose. All right. Next, uh, we have to look at passion. What are you passionate about? What is the thing that, that you would do if you weren't making any money? And that's a good money question to ask. Yeah. What would I be doing even if I wasn't getting paid for? You know, the story is told of a mother who um, lived in a lowland tribe in, in the Andes Mountains, and they took her baby to the highland tribe because there was a, a great war going on. And the warriors left to get that child back, and uh, the mother watched the warriors and hoped and, and prayed that they would bring her baby back. The warriors had to turn back because the storm and the, the terrain prevented them from getting the child. So to the mother's dismay, she left in all the clothes that she had on into this snowstorm. And to the amazement of the whole village, she came back with her baby in hand. And they asked, even the warriors and, and the village leaders asked, how in the world were you able to get your child back when some of my best men were defeated by this endeavor? And she looked at them with focused eyes and said, this was not your baby. What are you passionate about? What are the things in your life that you would do if you weren't getting paid for? I like what Dr. King says. He says, if you are living a life that, if you're doing something, excuse me, if you're not doing anything that you're willing to die for, you're not fit to live. And it kind of summarizes and, and, and puts in you know, perspective that word passion. Secondly, if you're freezing. No one's going to come to see you freeze, but people will come from miles around to see you burn. <laughs> the thing that you're passionate about will attract not only people to you, but resources to you. Uh, lastly, uh, a plan. And uh, I'll highlight this. How am I doing with time, Vito, if you can help me out? You're doing really ten well. Minutes, you got about 10 you. minutes. Um, I had a, a gentleman, and this is, this is a story that really changed my life, so I want to share it with you. At, at about 2007, um, after I became a pastor, I went for my chaplaincy license, and at the graduation, there was a gentleman, his name was John Carter, and he worked with uh, Bush, he worked with John Maxwell, he worked with uh, the Obama administration. His organization was the Institute for Increased Performance. And when he spoke, you know, I said, wow, I, I really want to meet this guy. And when he put out the offer to the graduates that anyone who wants to have a time, personal time with him, he'd meet with them, I didn't think twice. <coughs> I walked up to him and, and made the uh, appointment and, and he came to my house and I, I discussed my life and discussed uh, certain things with him. And I told him that, you know, I had so many things that I wanted to do in life and uh, the thing that was missing was I needed money. So he looked at me and, and with eyes of wisdom, he looked at me and said, Mike, you don't need money. He said, what you need is a plan. And how many of you have <laughs> ever had those Daniel Sun moments where on one hand you're thankful and, and you, you know there's, there's an enigma and a puzzle to be explored and then you get your answer, but on the other hand, you just want to smack the person. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I felt. But 
Some years later, and this is a story that I'm putting in my book, 30 Things That I've Learned in 30 Years That You Can Learn in 30 Days on Life and Purpose. Because it, it, it changed me so much. What, what I realized over time, it took me years to get it. I, I grabbed the statement, but it took me some time to digest it and apply it to my life. And what I realized was, he was absolutely right. I didn't need money. I needed a plan. Because like MacGyver, he was able to be in any situation, any circumstance, no matter how devastating it was, and find a way or make one. And so what that let me realize was there are things right now, and this can apply to you, and, and hear me out here, that we might feel we need more money, but there's a plan right under our nose. Using the things that we already have, there's a plan yet to be thought that we can put into practice with what we have right now that will be able to get us the things that we want. And so there's this money talk of, I need more money. We all are doing things for money. But in our pursuit, we need to keep in perspective the fact that there is a plan. And we need to find that plan. And it's not about needing money. It's about needing that plan. And lastly, to encourage you, I want to remind you that we have to be selectively hearing in our pursuit of our life's passion. Because like I said before, there are always going to be people who and obstacles to stand in your way. Friends are going to want you to be uh, more safe than successful. Family will love you too much to have you risk your life or risk your future for a bigger payout. And that's just the way it is. So we have to be unstoppable within ourselves because there are dreams. And I, I look around at the room and, and there, there's so much vision. Vision, I don't even think we have time to, to go around the room and ask what in this world do you want to do? But I can, I can see it, I can feel it. And we need to be unstoppable and know that we have to be selective in our hearing because there was a frog who fell into a hole. And this, this frog, the hole was lined with branches and, and leaves and, you know, it kind of scraped the frog and the frog wanted to jump out of the hole, rightly, right? And so the frog began to jump out and as the frog jumped, you know, it scraped his arm and scraped his leg. And as he jumped higher, a group of village frogs circled around the rim of this hole trying to protest to him to stop jumping because each time he jumped, he hurt himself. You know, they were saying, why don't you just die a slow, safe death? You're going to die anyway. Might as well do it on your own terms, rather than to, to die prematurely because you're, you know, hurting yourself in the process. But the frog kept jumping. And the more the, the frogs protested at the top of the rim, the more the frog jumped. It came to the point where the, the frogs at the rim, they, they screamed and yelled and said, stop jumping, stop jumping, just die. <laughs> the frog, the frog said, you know what? I have to take one more shot. And the frog jumped and it jumped out of the hole. Mm -hmm. And then the community of frogs was surprised. They asked and they interviewed them, how were you able to jump out of the hole? Not to mention, we were rooting against you jumping out of the hole. It turns out the frog was deaf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you're looking at Bridget and saying, no wonder she has such a drop, right? Because uh, unlike all of us, she gets to hear what she wants to hear. <laughs> so he's. He, he said, in whatever ways he knew how to communicate, that when they were rooting against him, he didn't know that they were telling him to stay and die. He thought they were showing their support for him and cheering him on. Wow. So he thought, the more they cheered, I have a responsibility to respond. So as they cheered more and more, he said, I have to do this. And that's how he jumped out. So the bottom line is, people can either be the fuel or the water to your fire. The choice is yours. Thank you.